Hi, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, firstly, before we begin, I'd just like to thank all of our speakers. You were magnificent today. You gave incredible speak. You can really see your passion, your knowledge and expertise on show today. It's fantastic. I'd also like to thank our funders. We got funding from Lush. We got funding from Loco for this event. So I'd like to say thank you very much to them, because without them, this wouldn't be going on at all. And finally, just to thank the Metropole for all of the help they've given us, to giving us the venue. They've done a fantastic day today, so brilliant. So, everyone, so starting, my talk is about working together to make a change. So how we can really make a change in natural flood management and what we'd like to do. Um, so really, it comes out from the idea that a lot of time when you go to talks like this, and I've gone to many of them, you get the feeling that all of this is kind of the academic side, that it's all looked after, that this is all being done and there's nothing you can really do, when that's not the case. There are things that each and every one of us have to do, because the fact of the matter is we're going through a crisis at the moment. We're going through a climate crisis. And if each and every one of us doesn't stand up and really make a point or do things, we're not free. We're going to kind of die out as a species, which, as depressing as that may sound, it is the truth of the matter, to be honest. Anyway, let's move on. So first of all, to talk about it. So basically, it's just to bring natural flood management and natural water retention measures to the public consciousness, because never will you ever get legislation passed until there is a public backing behind it, until the TDs hear it on the door. Every single time they go out, they hear people going on about natural flood management, going on about natural water retention measures. You won't really see that. We also have to clear up the misconceptions about it. This was really brought clearly to me when I was going around um, Cork City, putting up these posters, asking places to put up posters. There's one pub that I went into, and I said, can I put up a poster? It's about this flood management. Uh, meeting. The first question he asked me was, are you against the Love to Leave project? <laughs> I, I was like, what? How is that even possible? We're just, we, we're working together. So it's all about working together. No one's against anyone else. We're just another thing. It seems strange to me that anyone could even contemplate that we would be against the Love to Leave project. It just shows you how little people know about what natural flood management really is. Um, second, again, as I was saying, it's only when it comes into national consciousness do politicians act on it. So it's when they realize that it's their seats that are in trouble, that's when they'll start voting for it. After this, I'd like to talk about the general public. So when we speak of this, is to speak about the general public, you must realize that they are not general. They are not one homogenous group in any way. People have very different ideas on what natural flood management is, what it should do. They have very different experience of it. Some people have been affected by flooding directly. Other people may, may not have been affected at all, but know quite a lot about it. Others know nothing at all. So you must be willing to speak to them. You also, also must be able to respect the opinions of people. They may not be opinions we agree with, nor opinions we think are right in any way, but you must be able to respect them. And from that point, then move on to try and change those opinions. After that, firstly, rivers, they're not threats. People have the idea that rivers are threats, that they cause flooding, that they cause damage. They can, but that is not what they are. They're living, breathing ecosystems. They're benefits to our society. They're not just what can happen to them, they're what they can be. Most of the damage that's been caused by rivers is because they haven't been managed properly. They've been dredged in the past. They've been looked at as drains rather than as actually living, breathing ecosystem. So then the benefits that they can give are things like recreation, biodiversity, drinking water, fishing, flood protection. Now, do I have it here? No, that's later on into the sheet. Fantastic. So we're going to move on to our next one. So our next one, it allows us to reconnect with nature. Now, this is a photo I always show whenever I talk about reconnecting nature and things like this. This is Zion National Park. This is Angel's Landing. It took me six and a half hours to climb up to the top of that, and it was 30 degrees heat, and I almost died. But it was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my entire life. And see rivers, and this is a picture we have of a river in Cork from Simon Tussier. He gave us this photo. Again, look at the beauty of this place. How many people, how many of our greatest thinkers who've lived have sit in front of a river and contemplated life? And then if we take away this, if we dredge all these rivers, we're removing that from future generations, from their own chance to have a similar connection to nature. So then we're going to say, write to your local politicians and your MEPs. So all of our local councillors, outside we have a list of all of the local councillors that are in Cork, their email addresses and where their constituent offices are. Make sure you email them. Make sure you plague them. We have um, a tape template of, um, of an email and a letter that you could send to them. So, that, you, so that, that way, you now know no one has an excuse at all not to do this, because we are giving you the exactly what to do and where to send it. And that way, when you do that, you're really beginning to get it into the 
minds of the politicians that this is something people want. Then what you have to do is ask them their, ask them their opinions on environmental issues and make sure they have them. You are well within your rights if you, someone comes to your door canvassing, as they will in the next coming weeks, and you ask them, what is your, issue, what is your position on natural management? What is your position on in, environmental issues? And they say, oh, this isn't a doorstop issue, or oh, I haven't heard this. You're quite well in your rights to go, well, I'm not speaking to you about anything else. Until you have one, we will not speak to you about anything else. Make politicians realize that this is their seat. If they do not have a position on these issues, then we will, we will find someone who will have positions on these issues. And that's exactly what we're saying. Next one, have a position on natural flood management. Our public representatives must represent us. They are the people who we've elected to into these positions to elect us. Make sure they do. Make sure that they represent what we want from our society and what we want from our environment and our change in that. Now, this is a fantastic um, list that was put up at a Cork Environmental Forum on what you can actually ask your TDs, your councillors, whenever they come to your doors. So some fantastic questions here. Would you consider supporting a ban on council spraying of gossip and other chemicals? There's some fantastic things that you can ask your councillors and your politicians if ever you get a chance. <coughs> then after this, we have vote. Little did I think being in a, an event like this would I be telling people to vote. But in a liberal society that we are blessed to live in, it is their most important right, and we have to use it. Too long in Ireland has our politics been a cycle, been a cycle from continuing, continuing, continuing. We have two main political parties in Ireland. Let's call them Party A and Party B. <laughs> and they are exactly the same. <laughs> they are. They are avoided by civil war politics of 100 years ago. That's what they are. I like to think of them as the divorced parents of Ireland. <laughs> one, one of them is the mother. She's there, she looks after them all day, you know, makes them feed their greens, makes them go and makes all the difficult decisions on healthcare and the environment and things like this. And then the other is the weekend dad, who everyone loves. He goes mad, gives all the children all the chocolate. They love them, we have a giant boom, and then Sunday morning comes, the sugar rush has ended, the crash comes, we have cavities in our teeth, and we're back to ma'am then on Monday morning to send us to the dentist. This has to stop. Our other political parties, to be honest, they're not much better. We need a change. We need a change in our Irish parties. I'm not even saying to have a new party. It's more we need to just change the system that we're in. So by saying this, what I'm reading says, be willing to change. If you've voted for one political party your entire life and they don't have um, an opinion on environmental issues, you tell them, I'm not going to vote for you anymore until you do. Vote for a different party. And if enough people do that, very soon you'll find these parties will be saying that environmentalism was the core of our issue during the entire time. We've been based on environmental issues for the last 100 years. We must make them see that it is their seats, it is their livelihoods that are affected, because it will be our livelihoods that are affected if they don't make a change in the environment. After this, we have things that we ourselves can do, like planting trees. So planting trees is a fantastic way, as you've heard many of our speakers already say today, on increasing biodiversity, but also increasing natural flood management and natural water retention measures. Planting trees are one of the best things we can do. We have the natural woodland scheme, as Tony was speaking about earlier on today. And that's a one thing as well, a way you can actually get funding to actually plant native trees in around areas. You can plant riparian buffers. Again, this is basically just what Tony was saying for the last fine. And then finally, we have to protect our river banks because lots of animal species like um, Sam Martins, or Sam, yes, they live in banks. So you need to have them, um, you need to protect the banks so we have these species there. Then after that, we have to take ownership of our rivers. Now, this, I think, is an incredibly important thing because our rivers are seen as drains. They're seen as a place to dredge, to dump, to throw all of the things we don't need and then to, for them to wash downstream to be a problem for people downstream. We need to take ownership of them. We need to look after them. The number of rivers in Ireland have dropped from 500 in pristine condition in the 1980s to 21 in 2015. So we need to change this. We need to look after them. Rivers are valuable resources. They're things we get value from them. It gives our biodiversity, our drinking water, recreation, and flood protection. Now, here it was. There is... In 2015, it was estimated that biodiversity was worth 
145 trillion US dollars worldwide. That's twice the entire GDP of the entire world. That is what biodiversity gives us. If we lose this, this is what we are losing. Um, angling alone in Ireland is worth 70, 755 million euro. So again, if we don't protect our rivers, we're losing all of this for the Irish economy. So we have to just protect the threats from because they are very, very real. After this now, these are just pictures of pollution. So this is a picture of a river, of the Polka River in Dublin. That was when the children was spilled into it. And finally, this is of a beach in Cork. It's surprisingly difficult to find pictures on Google of river pollution in Ireland. I don't know why. Every single pollution, every single river you find pollution for, you find it for Mumbai, you find it for all of this. But I wanted to find an Irish connection, even though we know ourselves from all of our studies that Irish rivers are not in a good state of health. It seems to me almost that there's not many people out looking at them. or I don't know what it is, but it just seems quite strange. And then after this, you can join and create rivers trusts. Now, these are fantastic things. Now, rivers trusts are charities established by local people to look after and protect improve rivers, streams, lakes in a particular river catchment or an area comprised of many river catchments. They're often described as having wet feet because they're the ones that get out into the environment. They're the ones that actually look after the animals kind of are looking after the wildlife really and their rivers in the very low level out at the stream level. They're fantastic. They've done some incredible work. They're often caused, they're often created due to a trigger. So key triggers in the past have been declining in species and water quality, pollution incidents, loss of fish and other wildlife, and creation, and they were created with aim to protect and restore rivers. Now a lot of time, what a lot of the um, rivers trusts in Britain, there's been fantastic success in this, they often use, are used to kick sample upper river catchments, because the EPA actually only tracks river quality from rivers from a third order, order down. They don't track anything above that because anything above that is just too difficult and too time consuming. That's where rivers trusts in Britain have actually come to their own because they begin to kick sample rivers up above these areas. And they've actually been able to find point source pollution from these upper rivers. Some of the rivers they've found that maybe one single catchment stream is accounting for maybe about 20 or 30% of the pollution of the entire river itself downstream. So they're incredibly important because they, they don't replace the EPA. What they do is they help the EPA because they can give their own sample then give that to the EPA. The EPA can figure out there's a problem here, go out, do a full-on sample of this area, and then figure out exactly where that problem is. So rivers trusts can be fantastically effective in areas like that. So there's over 60 trusts in Britain and Ireland. So seven in the Republic, seven in Northern Ireland, 44 in England and Wales, and then you have 25 in Scotland. Now these are the lists of the rivers trusts in the Republic. So you've got the Blackwater, you've got the Magner, you've got Waterville, at the Nor, Slaney, Mull Catchment, Erin, the Blackwater Rivers Catchment, and the Abandoned Rivers Trust is just a newly created one, which is, you can see that it's really gaining traction in Ireland, which is fantastic. And this is where they are situated. So you can see them up here, the ones in Northern Ireland, and the ones down below here. This, I'm guessing, may be an old map because we don't have the black, the abandoned one there yet. Fantastic. As well, now what I want to talk about is it's the whole thing of it's us versus them. People are often, we often have an adversarial narrative around natural flood management. It's often it's either natural flood management or hard engineering, it's often one or the other. This is never really the case, it is both. So you have to do both, you have to, in some areas natural flood management may not be as effective as putting in walls, it might not be as happy. We may not be happy about this, but sometimes that is the case. We need to use both. There are sometimes when one, um, so they really work together in this as many of our speakers were earlier saying today. And natural flood management is often for the long term, it's often a long term solution, whereas hard engineering is very short term. It does fix a problem, it fixes it in a specific area just about here for a specific time, but over time that will not no longer be effective, especially with climate change coming in, natural flood management really works for a much longer time scale. And perfect, now this is on the removal of the Arterial Drainage Act 1945. Someone already earlier on today was speaking about this. Now this is an act that not many people know about. It's also an incredibly insidious act and it's an act that has allowed many of our rivers to actually be um, kind of dredged and destroyed in the last number of years. The strange thing about it is it basically supersedes all other Irish legislation. So 
So it's a legislation that the OPW will always revert back to. If ever they're dredging an SPA or something like that, they'll, often, they'll always revert back to the Arterial Drainage Act, why this is the case. It states that farming is the main activity of the land, and thus everything must be done to protect farming. If your river, if your land is flooded, and that means you cannot be productive in that certain area, then that means that land must be drained so that you can be productive in that area. It talks about how the economic value is the most important. Is the main rivers main reason that many of the rivers have been dredged and narrowed is because of the Arterial Drainage Act. But the thing about it is it binds the hands of the OPW. It says that they must do this. It doesn't give them a choice. That is the problem with this act. It's not that the OPW wants to do this, it's that they have to by legislation. So that is why we must change it. As well, the strange thing about it is that EU, although EU law does trump national law, so that means that if you were dredging in an SPA, you could say that this is protected under EU legislation, thus you can't. The OPW will often uh, revert back to the um, Arterial Drainage Act, and that is why it is such an insidious piece of legislation. The strange thing is the OPW as well maintains rivers as they were back in 1945, but Ecofax have shown that they don't have, reg don't have records for our rivers back in 1985, or 1945, excuse me. So they're maintaining them to an arbitrary standard. So it's quite terrible, really. And then as well, the most insidious part, and I truly think, is that they must maintain the infrastructure that is created. This is by law. So if a river is dredged once, it must be dredged again. If, if uh, walls are put up here, they must be protected again. So the OPW can't do anything. There are people inside the OPW, and as you can see, the OPW have begun to look into natural flood management. They've begun funding some PhDs, as Mary is doing down below here. But a lot of what they're doing now, they actually have to by legislation, which is quite sad. So that's why I think that piece of law must be removed. If you want to move forward, it must be removed or it must be changed. Mm -hmm. So then the OPW can become the organisation that we want them to be. And as well now, stop demonising farmers. Farmers. <laughs> so farmers, they are the greatest stewards of our land. They're the ones that are out there the entire time. They're the ones that are always outside there. The economic, the environmental damage that has occurred is often due to lack of knowledge rather than from malice. As Tony said, a farmer came to and said he'd throw a lash of silage on top of that area there. You can see people want to help. People want to do things, but they just don't know how. That's why people with the expertise must come in and tell people how to do this and really look after them. As well, EK environment damage was often caused by following the best practice of the time. If you think about all of the overgrazing on our uplands that happened during the 1980s when the cap was telling farmers, you must overstock the uplands. You must put more cattle, more well, sheep up on the uplands at this time. So again, a lot of the environment damage that we're now giving out to farmers about now was caused by, they followed exactly what they were told to do back then. It's mistakes of the past. That's my la, next one. Stop dwelling on the mistakes of the past. <laughs> we understand they were mistakes. They were terrible things. They should not have happened, but they did. They, were, they happened because we followed what we were told to do a lot of the times. Have to stop that and move on to the next thing. Move on to the next. We have to really recognize our mistakes and move forward. It's often the hardest thing to do because to blame is fantastic. It feels brilliant to just shout and scream. It's amazing. But we can't do that. We have to move forward. We have to come together, really. And this comes to the thing that I've heard called the 90-10 rule. And I spent a year in Montana for third year of college. And there we went to a community farming area called the Blackfoot Challenge. And in there, there it's, it's an area about half the size of Munster, because Montana is about three times of Ireland. It's gigantic. And all the farmers in this area, they came into a community, um, community farming regime, which with the National Parks and Wildlife out there. So they have lots of conflict with wild animals, like bears and wolves taking their cattle, a lot of their they have a lot of problems actually with water as well, from water rights, people taking too much water out because it's quite an arid area. So then the national parks came in and they wanted to really increase the biodiversity in this area. And they found out that they were having terrible, terrible issues. Because they go into a um, farmer's land and they tell them, oh, we want to allow uh, wolves onto your land. And they just went, nope, they kill my cattle. No, not at all. And they realized they weren't getting anywhere. 
So then they went from a totally different angle. They went down and asked, what do you want? What biodiversity would you like on your land? And there was one farmer, he came along and said, oh, I remember my, my father had ducks on the land, but now I use that water to water my cattle and have no ducks anymore. So then National Parks said, OK, we'll fix up that pond if you no longer put your cattle into it. And two years later, they had ducks. And the farmer said, what's the next thing I can do? What's the next thing I can do? So what they said was the 90-10 rule. If you agree with someone on 90% and disagree with 10%, work with them on the 90%. They may come around with 10%, they may not. But you've still got 90% of the things you want it done. So always work on 90%, not don't always concentrate on things that we can do. Don't concentrate on things that we disagree with. Then to say you catch more flies with honey with vi than with vinegar. And finally, natural flood managing, it's much more than just flooding. It's often called natural water retention measures, and this highlights this point. It can help with climate change, protects biodiversity, reduces pollution in areas, especially runoff from fields and things like that. And also it can really help with carbon sequ sequestration, um, especially if you kind of bring back our wetlands, bogs, things like that. So fantastic. So everyone, thank you very much.